Laura and Karen, thanks for uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Well, we're happy to be here. Um, as he said, we are two of the four uh, co-founders of Ben Pedal Brewing Company. Um, we have a presentation to go through. Uh, we welcome questions at any time. Just kind of interject, raise your hand, and uh, we'll get started. Cool. Um, so we're going to do, not the full PowerPoint, we're going to scroll up and down. So crafting a business, building up a dream, Ben Pedal Brewing Company. Um, I won't read the full thing here, but we're a 30-barrel production craft brewery. So in Minnesota, there's a legal difference between a brew pub like Fitgers or Great Waters, uh, Barley John's, uh, even Canal Park Brewery, and production breweries like Summit, Surly, and us. So we're um, a production brewery. So most of what we do is manufactured for the marketplace. I'm going to say 95% mm -hmm. of what we do is, is out the door in kegs and cans. And then we have a, a tap room on site. Um, I, has anybody? Is, I don't know who's, who's 21. 21. Has anybody been to Bent Paddle? Good. Okay. Um, so th those of you that have been, um, we're we're in Lincoln Park, so we're just um, about two miles from the canal, and uh, we have an on-site tap room. So we're open Wednesday through Sunday. We offer free tours on Saturdays and Sundays, which is kind of a neat experience for those of you who are 21 to learn a little bit more and see behind the scenes. Um, our mission, we do like to say that, our mission at Ben Paddle Brewing Company is to brew craft beer with a concentration on sustainability for our business, employees, the environment, and the greater community, all while bending the traditions that we encounter for a more unique and interesting craft beer experience. So we try to live by that every day, the mission piece. These are the, we're two of the four co-founders, the ones without beards, <laughs> um, So it's myself and my husband, Colin. Mm -hmm. Brian and Karen Tonis, yeah. uh, two married couples. A lot of weird facts about that is uh, we got married nine days apart in 2008, and our children are three days apart, <laughs> and they are almost four. So uh -huh. weird, like, dual lifestyles. Uh, you'll see in a second, but Brian and Colin were both brewers down in the Twin Cities and um, knew each other through the Minnesota Craft Brewers Guild and all the things. So there we are, two married couples. Um, so, as she said, um, we all met each other in the industry. Um, well, I fell in love with a brewer, so that's my in. But Laura, um, Laura was the Minnesota Craft Brewers Guild uh, event coordinator, and Colin and Brian were on the board of directors and professional brewers. So, we all met. Uh, we'll go into a little bit more about what each person was doing um, more in depth, but... Basically, it came to a point where we were working really hard for other people, and we decided, how can we build a future for ourselves? So we got together over a beer, of course, and uh, realized that we shared a really similar uh, business philosophy, brewing philosophy, and just um, we, had, we, we just had a shared dream, and that's how we decided to partner. And for partnership, um, Colin and I started my first company, an event planning company, when I was 25. And not going to lie, running a business is a lot of work. So it was primarily me, but my husband, Colin, who was working full-time in a different brewery, um, helped me a lot, too. So the idea for partnership came f for us because we knew we wanted to start families and have more of a work-balanced life. So we, we liked the idea of partnership because... Uh, one group can go on vacation and the other ownership team is there. People can be sick or take care of family emergencies or whatever, and there's a lot of layers of mm -hmm. that and of uh, having ownership mm -hmm. presence at the brewery at all times. So it has worked out very well for us. It is very it is contractually yeah. down pat, too, because partnerships are also no picnic in some ways, so we have a lot of legal, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of legal uh, pl things in place. Um, and all of this was from the very beginning. We always say that we got married twice, and we have twins, so we're kind of... We married our spouses, and then we married each it's other. A, in it's a big commitment. Um, uh, we are one of the few breweries, uh, period, in the, in the U.S., and especially in Minnesota, that is 50% female-owned, so we're incredibly proud of that. Um, there are the guys. This is when they were a little bit more cleaned up and dapper looking. Um, I don't know if you've seen brewers, but they just they develop these large beards, and it's kind of uh, a prerequisite for 
brewery ownership. So there's my husband. Uh, he is the director of brewing operations. He's from La Crosse, Wisconsin. Uh, we met in 1996 at UMD. Um, so we've known each other a very long time. Uh, he does have his degree in brewing. There is such a thing. Um, I'm not suggesting you switch from business <laughs> ethics or accounting. But uh, he studied in Munich, Germany, Chicago, through, uh, it's called the Siebel World Brewing, um, it's Doman's World Brewing Academy, or the Siebel Institute. Uh, he brewed a long time ago at a place that's no longer in business called Twin Ports Brewing. It's now Thirsty Pagan. And he was... Um, in Superior. Yep, in Superior. And <coughs> then he was in the Rock Bottom family in Portland and Minneapolis prior to starting Bent Paddle. Um, he took over the head brewing position there uh, after Todd fra who left to go to Surly. So the head brewer at Surly. Yes. And then Brian was his next person in line. So Brian is all things spreadsheets now in our lives. When we first opened, him and Colin were brewing the beer. They were packaging the beer, delivering, um, the, beer. delivering the beer. And, at, you know, moving into year three of our business, uh, we've all taken on a little bit different responsibilities as we continue to grow so rapidly. So Brian spends his time um, really on the financial and the contractual um, long-term business development plans. Um, our material. Basically, he does all of our uh, procurement for our hops, malt, yeast, equipment, um, and he does all of our production scheduling. So and uh, the beer, getting the beer to the distributors as well. Mm -hmm. like and just to kind of go back uh, one step, when we first. Um, we we kind of went through um, when we first decided to partner. We literally took an entire year to write a business plan. Um, we definitely didn't rush into it at all. Uh, we did a seven year projection. So Brian and Colin, we were working full time um, right up until we basically moved to Duluth to open the company and the guys were writing our business plan and they did a seven year projection, which we outgrew in one year. So we're back to writing that. <laughs> <laughs> so the timeline, uh, for into, in 2010, we both had ideas of starting a production brewery in Duluth. Both couples separately hadn't even talked to each other. Uh, we, it came up and we started discussing the idea of partnership. So it really took a year to go from, so all of 2010 basically, um, to decide what we were up to, decide the basics, uh, Duluth, why, the water, we'll get into that later, name, partnership, legality of all that stuff. And then uh, in 2011, we took a year to write a business plan with a local um, consultant. And that is the one thing, it was a, an amazing roadmap, um, incredibly thorough, incredibly beautiful too, because we had to go out and get investors. Um, so we made these like crazy packets, and it really just emphasized how into branding we were and how detailed and everything. So we really think that has a huge part to do with our success. It just really proved to each other that we were ready to do this and do it really well. And then uh, we got all the funding, which basically we have 23 um, private investors, uh, some bank loans from Republic Bank locally. We've had a great relationship with local bank. Uh, the SBA gave us a portion of that and the ARDC, Arrowhead Regional Development Corporation. So some economic development uh, pieces in there. And then just our own personal capital as well. So that is how we raised the money. And then we started Build Out in 2012. In, yeah, October in October of 2012, and we opened in May of 2013. So we're not quite three yet. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. So there's Brian and a lot of other info. <laughs> uh, here's Colin. He's from St. Louis Park. He went to Gustavus. <coughs> Music, performance, and psychology. Perfect for Perfect running a brewery. For brewery. <laughs> um, he definitely started home brewing at the tail end of college um, and fell in love with it. So right after college, he got a job at Midwest Home Brewing Supply, which was very small at the time. Um, and he grew their all grain system and their online, and it's a huge company now. And mm -hmm. I think there were like six employees when he started. Um, and then he was at Barley John's running there. Um, and a neat story about him is he, you know, he was working as a home brewer. Uh, there were only like 20 breweries at the time for most of the 2000s. Um, in Minnesota. In Minnesota, excuse me. And now there's lots. We'll get into the growth piece. But he really wanted to actually get into brewing. So he'd like hang out at the bar at Barley John's and like try to talk to the owner, John, as much as possible. 
And about, I don't know, eight months into doing that and just being really perseverant, uh, John needed some barrels picked up in Milwaukee, and vo- Colin volunteered to drive to Milwaukee in a truck and get all these barrels for him. And it really, like, sometimes if you want something, you have to really be <laughs> persistent and, do, and go above and beyond. And that's his story of how he got truly into the brewing system is John then added him as his apprentice, and then John got way stuck in other things, and Colin ended up brewing all the beer at Barley Johnson. It was very award-winning while he was there. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he handles, he used to do the brewing, and he definitely has a great palate, so he and Brian work together on recipe, you know, we all sort of do, but Brian and Colin primarily, on um, what the beer is going to look like for the next year, what kind of brands, what's, you know, what do they like. A lot of um, the bending tradition aspect of, of Bent Paddle is taking classic styles and doing a slight tweak on them that makes it our own. Um, and that's something, I don't know, you're all a bit young, but there was like a real big hop movement like eight years ago. Everything needed to be hoppy and really aggressive, and our guys are, are like <coughs> ahead of the curve because they've been through all that, so they're kind of into more sessionable beers and like very balanced and calm, and that's definitely become the, the what Bent Paddle is mm-hmm. in terms of beer style. So Again, we shared that catches up. philosophy. Um, Partnering is a big deal. So right off the bat, it was like, I want to do double IPAs and super hoppy, you know, and we wanted to do something else. It wouldn't have worked. They really had quite. So Colin, again, was a huge part in writing our business plan. Um, He does a lot of our creative, um, creative design, graphic design, uh, website development, um, so we all kind of wear different hats. Yeah, and he does all the tech work, and he's currently implementing new software. Yes. And then there we are. <laughs> uh, so I'm Karen again. Um, I'm VP of operations, again, 25% owner. Uh, prior to opening Bent Paddle, I, I worked at the same company for 15 years, um, I learned everything that I do now, uh, which was extremely uh, beneficial for me. Uh, I did go to UMD, and I transferred down to Metro State. Uh, I was focusing on business administration. Um, My company I worked for for 15 years was Cisco Asian Foods. So Cisco, you've probably seen the trucks, um, food service distributor, largest in the country, And I worked for their, um, they called it the sister operation, which was Asian food. So a food service distributor for Asian restaurants. Um, I started there at 18 years old, answering the phone and making copies for eight hours a day. And I worked my way up into uh, accounts receivable. And then I was administrative assistant. And then I was the assistant to our HR department. Then I was the HR manager, office manager, and then my longest tenure at the company was operations and logistics management, Um, and I did that for eight years. So it set us up for lots of different um, and distribution. So uh, yeah, and then like I said, I fell in love, and I fell in love with craft beer, and I fell in love with the idea of working for me and our family, and uh, yeah. Um, Brian and Karen also had a uh, s- semi-professional photography mm-hmm. business, so all of the images, most of the images, we're trying mm-hmm. to farm it out a little more now because of busyness, but uh, especially initially our beautiful images yeah. from Brian and Karen. Uh, this is me. I'm from Duluth, born and raised. I was gone for 15 years, but super happy to be back. Uh, I went to Madison with a behavioral science and law as a pre-law degree. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, again, so maybe this is showing you, like, like things can you learn you. a lot at the liberal arts education. You can do whatever. <laughs> um, I had my own event planning company again uh, for about ten years. So I, yeah, so pre-law major, event planner, brewery owner, you know, um, and I also worked for. My largest client was the Minnesota Craft Brewers Guild. So I ran um, all the beer fests for them, and it ended up doing a lot of admin. They were my halftime client because it was really hard to get breweries to come to the beer fest when they weren't signed up to even be in the guild. So I ended up just trying to, like, herd the cats that are brewers. I'm still doing that. So that's fun. Um... I do, at my title here is VP of Outreach and Events, so I do event planning. We have a large 
uh, anniversary party. It'll be our third year. It's called Festiversary, and it's coming up on May 14th. Uh, so just getting started in the planning of that. We had about 2,200 people last year, um, up from 1,500 the first year. So it's our own, like, mini beer fest, but it's, like, for a Duluth event, it's pretty large for how, how new it is. Um, help Colin with design stuff. Uh, Karen and I designed the tap room, things like that. Coordinate media and community outreach. We have a huge charitable program, so basically anyone who fits a certain level of criteria can get beer or items if for their nonprofit, you know, fundraiser of any kind. So we have a huge outreach program that has actually taken the place of a lot of traditional me media and advertising mm -hmm. for us and has been amazing uh, to feel fully immersed in the Duluth community from day one. I'm just going to dovetail off that since a lot of you are here for business ethics. Um, one of the things that was most important to us when we talked about starting a business was how we could paddle it forward. So how could we be a good community partner to Duluth and to Minnesota? So we sat down and we talked about, um, you know, we, we started, obviously, as we were during startup, we didn't have a lot of capital to paddle it forward. Um, that's since grown and we're more than happy to do it, but we, we kind of we steer our stuff to local Duluth, um, environmental, uh, human-powered human sports, uh, medical um, associations, and since opening, we've done um, yeah, $200,000 worth of um, giving, giving back to the community, so we're incredibly proud of that. Um, and it makes us feel good about, um, you know, we're obviously a for-profit company, so we sell beer, uh, but it makes us feel good, so. Part of the mission. There we are. Yay. There's our little one. <laughs> um, a lot, that's yeah. us pregnant uh, together. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people Just ask beer. us, what is it like to own your own business? Well, uh, we also have little ones, so, you know, I was joking, I was running late on the way here because my husband had to get up, get in, um, help sick. calibrate a new piece of uh, equipment that we had while well, we have a sick little guy, so we high-fived on the way out, and I'll see him at about 8 o'clock tonight after uh, we work all day, and then we have another speaking event at UMD tonight. So um, we're very busy, um, but we're only three, yeah. so we, we planned for this, and... Um, we make it work. We make it work, uh, but we work together quite well. So These two um, have known each other since they were born, and that's them cruising around the brewery, and they're just brewery babies, and it's great. Um, so this was way back when, in 2013 when we were putting up temporary signage that says brewery and tap room coming soon. So Brian's up on a rented lift putting up the sign. Um, here's some of our... Oh, yeah. yeah, we did do this. So we kind of talked about that... That's us at the ribbon cutting with Mayor Don Ness. Um, we we kind of skimmed through why Duluth. Um, Duluth is obviously on on uh, the shores of Lake Superior. So Lake Superior is ten percent of the world's fresh water. It makes for incredibly awesome brewing water. Um, it's soft and so. It's kind of like a blank slate for the recipes that we have developed. Uh, we did a lot of water analysis, and the water of Lake Superior mimics the waters of Pilsen, Czech Republic, where Pilsners were born. So for us, uh, it's, it's one of the many reasons we're super proud of the quality of our beer. And we also love the community. Um, she's obviously from Duluth, born and raised Brian and I spent many years here, um, and we were just excited to get back. And it's it's such there's such a great energy in Duluth. There's so many uh, entrepreneurial businesses booming, and uh, we especially feel a part of it in Lincoln Park. Mm -hmm. So we're also extreme. All of us are, um, and, and most of our staff. Um, are incredibly engaged with outdoor recreation. So hiking, paddling, mountain biking, ice climbing, and it's the perfect place for that and our brand. Uh, Bent Paddle, the name, comes from uh, Brian and I. We are avid Boundary Waters canoeists. So, you know, again, we're quite busy, 
but we at least try to go once a year. And uh, the name came to us just kind of the mix between uh, Brian at his old brewery. Um, for those of you who have been to Bent Paddle, everything is mechanical. The tanks are quite large, but at the brew pubs, there was literally, they would mash in, uh, stirring the, the grain with the hot water with a bent shaft canoe paddle. And one day it broke. And uh, Brian had to run to his car during mash-in and, find, and grab his actual canoe paddle. Um, and he never used anything else. So the name kind of comes from the marriage between outdoor enthusiasm and brewing. So that's how the work, that's how the name Bent Paddle came to be. And just some of the fun nuance of design. So this is the logo which Colin designed way back when we first started, and it's tilted at a 14 degree angle, the same as a bent shaft canoe paddle. Um, and the ESB is named the 14 degree ESB. And we have, everyone's like, is that the temp in Duluth? And I'm like, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. So we're thinking of doing a taproom special when it's 14 degrees out. Um, That's our business plan. Um, as you can see, it, uh, you know, we, we definitely spent a lot of time uh, with the details. You know, what, what, how are our finances going to come to be? What is our capital going to be? What are the costs? We got all of the quotes long before we decided. Um, and we started the size we did because uh, it all came down to math and... Uh, what our return on investment would be. So we started at a 30-barrel system, as she mentioned. Um, and at the time, uh, that was quite big. And everybody asked, wow, you're starting so large. And here we are. Uh, we'll kind of get into it a little bit more, but we've completely outgrown our facility in just two and a half years. Um, so that happened. Um, <laughs> I touched briefly on fundraising. I mentioned how it was, but... This thing, investment triad, two out of three ain't bad means. Uh, so the investors that we went for, we went to a few like random angel <clears throat> investors or just people who like to invest, and they were like, meh. Um, but we ended up finding a neat mix of people who liked one or two of three things. Us, some connection to us, be that family or friends, or even people who frequented the bars at our um, husband's past <laughs> jobs. Uh, Duluth, they were connected to Duluth in some way and wanted to see young entrepreneurship happening, um, or craft beer lovers. So if usually it was two out of three, one out of three of those, um, and then the investment, uh, the investors were actually not that hard to find, which was really great for us. We were lucky. We, were lucky. <laughs> <laughs> we um, also had a sound business plan. We right. weren't just like, hey, we're starting a business. Do you want to <laughs> invest? Um, so there we are. Uh, again, for those of you who have been, it probably looks quite different. Uh, we found an old uh, steel manufacturing warehouse down in Lincoln Park, 10,600 square feet. Incredibly strong, um, thick concrete because the weight of the tanks with liquid is quite heavy. And we spent about six months building out. We had tall, the other reason we picked the facility was because it has uh, unusually tall ceilings. So we were looking to build our footprint up instead of out as we continued to expand. Um, again, we wrote a seven year business plan with uh, kind of this plug and play, uh, as we say, uh, scenario. So it's kind of like when this happens, we buy this tank. When we get to this level, we buy this tank. Um, and with that comes these utility upgrades. And So all that was in the business plan. So as soon as we reached certain sales thresholds, we knew the trigger for the next expansion. Mm -hmm. And the expansion didn't mean you know above the 10,600. It was expanding of tanks. So we'll get into a little bit on how the brewing side works. But basically, you brew one day on this one part of it, but then the beer rests in fermenters for two weeks for an ale, four weeks for a lager, and the amount of fermenters you have is what creates your expansion yeah. capability to right. a point. At some so, point you do need more square right. footage. So the picture down on the bottom right is our very first, it's how we started, and the brewery looked like that for just six months. Um, we do have 19 tanks now at Bent Paddle. These so. are even gone. These are 60 barrel fermenters, so you brew twice on this system to fill that. Uh, and now these are gone, and they're double the size, so they're 120 barrel fermenters. And then there's a whole row of 90s and a whole row of 120s there, so it's a completely different looking brewery yeah. now. So they're just three feet from the ceiling now. So um, we get our tanks from diversified metal engineering. Uh, people ask us all the time, 
Um, they're North, it's North American steel and uh, made in Canada, Prince Edward Island. Yes. Really great tank manufacturer. We'll go briefly into raw materials. We're not going to get too excited here, but oh, wait, process overview. Um, so, <laughs> oh, wait, there it is. Right. Uh, a barrel, one barrel of beer, which is the unit of measurement brewers use for all of their taxes and all of their, what's your annual barrelage? Is like a, how big of a deal are you? That's brewers ask each other. It's pretty funny. So one barrel is 31 U.S. gallons. So when you think of a keg at a keg party, uh, you, it's a 15.5 gallon uh, barrel. And so there are two of those that fill the old kind of wood barrels. Um, and that is the unit of measurement. So we started um, in May of 2013. So for six months, the six, end of 2013, we did 1,500 mm-hmm. barrels. Last year, we did almost 8,000. And this year, we did about 14,000. So huge amount of growth in that amount of time. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're Again, where we, thought we'd ha- where we had hoped we'd be at <coughs> year 10. So we, we basically said, how many barrels do we want to be at at year 10? And then we moved, and we, everything was in, done in reverse. So all the math and all the accounting and all the financials, we moved backwards from the goal that we had set for ourselves. Um, and same with thresholds of, uh, so it wasn't only tanks, it's like how many staff members yeah. do you get with this amount of barrelage? How many, you know, what, what infrastructure is the raw material do you need? Or raw materials you need. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So everything's a little bit crazy because of the rapid growth, which is awesome. <laughs> uh, but everything's a little shot. Uh, so basic overview of beer is uh, grain, mostly from the Midwest, but grain comes from, all, uh, malted barley comes from all over. There's European, and da, 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 but a lot of it comes from the Midwest. Um, we use primarily a group called a brewer supply group, VSG, out of shop. And they source all of the materials in the, on the grain side and the hop side. Uh, the grain gets milled in, it gets mixed with, it, you want to do this part? I oh. uh, <laughs> so we, we mill in the grain and it basically gets crushed open so we can extract sugars. I'm going to breeze through this. Yeah. Um, it very temporarily goes in what we call a grist case. And then we mash in. So the grain drops down and hits basically a hot water that's spraying it. So it initially softens it. And then in the tank, uh, it's filled with hot water and it has uh, mechanical rakes. So it stirs it. It's kind of like a giant bowl of oatmeal. Which was the The previous paddle uh, process on a smaller scale. So we're basically extracting the sugars. Um, Then it moves into basically... Uh, a kettle and we boil it and we add hops to it and just the wort moves over I skipped that part W-O-R-T um, and then the spent grain is then taken out of the tank and we donate it to farmers for feed which is kind of cool and another way we kind of try to pay it forward plus it was a lot of Mm -hmm. waste material so to have to find a different way to get rid of that would be just Mm -hmm. i think just incredibly wasteful but these farmers get free feed so it's and it has very good nutritional content we've had it analyzed so it boils for 120 minutes we add upwards of three cycles of hops for aromatics bitterness uh whatever recipe they're brewing and then at Whirlpools, it gets transferred to a, a, our fourth vessel, which is the Whirlpool. It, it Whirlpools, exactly what it's called. And all the solids from the hops drop out a solution. And then the liquid is transferred over to our fermenters. And as she mentioned, um, ales ferment uh, two weeks and lagers are four weeks. And it all comes down to the yeast strain you use and the temperature that you're fermenting at. And once that process is done, obviously the yeast's job is to eat up all the sugars and create alcohol, which is, of course, what we're going for here. <laughs> and then uh, it very temporarily moves to what we call a bright tank. And on the way to the bright tank from the fermenter, uh, it used to be filtered, and now we just uh, got our newest piece of production equipment called a centrifuge. It was our single most expensive investment to date. And it's basically a giant separator, so it uses centrifugal force to spin at, like, it literally is 7,000 RPMs, um, and all the solids drop out of solution, uh, which is kind of cool because it's unfiltered, um, and brewers are proud of that, to have clarity in their beer without filtering it. it. It also kind of allows the hops to keep more aromatic, 
Um, and then it goes to the bright tank, and then the bright tank is its very brief holding point until we put it into cans uh, or kegs. So that's, that's where it gets carbonated. That's a quick rundown of a very complicated process. Uh, so this is, uh, this is actually since... This um, is opening. Oh, this is opening. Yeah. So we kind of went through that. We had... We had... Uh, we're going to skip that. Yeah. We have 19 tanks now, as she mentioned. Um, and we have outgrown our space. So we are working quite aggressively on what our next plan is. Uh, we talked a little bit about the water. Uh, it's great. It's great. <laughs> we'll get into Yeah, that. this it's is kind of too technical. Yeah, bar we talked about malted barley a little bit too, so there's that part. So the reason that we have all of this in here, and we use this presentation for many different things, um, like we did a beer education class, uh, for example, but one of the things that was super important was contracts. So as she mentioned, five years ago, there were 20, 30 breweries in our state. Um, the Brewers Association numbers just came out, and there's 110 breweries in our state now, which is incredible growth. And one of the things that makes that challenging for breweries like ours uh, or even smaller breweries <coughs> is contracting raw materials so that your beer tastes the same every time because if you crack open a bent hop and it tastes different every time that's a big deal so literally before we even had a building before we had a business plan um before we basically had much funding we used our first twenty five thousand dollars to contract for hops and now we're contracting uh, three years out. Um, the way that it works is basically you, you meet with farmers, you pick your ideal hops or your ideal malts, and you contract the year you're in 100%, 90% for the following year, 70% for the year after that, and 50% for the year after that. So it is really important to kind of have a pulse on what you think your growth will be, any new recipes that you might think you're adding to your portfolio, even in years to come. Um, it's one of the most important things that we did was do that early. And I used to field a lot of calls when I, my client was the Minnesota Craft Brewers Guild, and it was a lot of, to be honest, like home brewers that were like, I've won an award, I want to start a business. And I'm like, but you don't know much about that. You should go work in the business or, or get an education in the business and all of that because it's a very... You need to know things like that, and it's tough to main, maintain quality control and all, all of those things. So our guys had a leg up because they knew mm -hmm. all of the connections and even to just do that. Great. Um, you can see the guys here. They went to Yakima Valley in Washington State, where most uh, American hops are grown. Huge, large-scale farming. Um, and the contracts, like we said, are for to get the farmers to know what their whole crop yield is going to look like. What percent is Armarillo hop? What percent is Cascade? You know, all the different things. So it's we're one of you know, lots right. of people contract, lots of different breweries contracting for hops. Um, but this is them picking from a batch of, from different farmers. Um, it's just kind of a, a fascinating thing. And just, thing. you know, uh, craft beer in general, out of all the beer in the United States, um, including macro brands, Bud Light, Miller Light, whatever, um, craft beer only makes up for 12% of all the beer uh, consumed in our country. Um, that number has actually grown. Uh, when we first wrote our business plan, it was about 9%. So that in and of itself, too, is something that we always have to be uh, conscious of and kind of ahead of the game uh, because with growth countrywide, that affects, uh, farmers can only grow so much crop. Um, and global warming is also a concern <laughs> for us because if, if we don't have the hops and the, you know, the malted barley and, um, and there's more growth, we just, it's just something that we always have our eye on. So it's kind of interesting. Um, yeast, there are many types of yeast. She got into the uh, deal that there's ale yeast and lager yeast primarily, but there's many types within that category. Um, we always say brewers make sugar water. 
yeast makes beer. So good job, yeast. <laughs> yeah, yeast is kind of cool. We have these conical fermenters because as the yeast uh, gets really ex- when you see a beer, a batch of beer brewed, you and you walk through the brewery with all these rows of fermenters, you can see ones that were brewed in the last couple of days because they have like uh, they have this out valve thing and it's got a lot of foam when it's really active because the yeast is just going crazy converting the sugar to alcohol and CO2, so it's spitting out CO2. Um, and then you can see the ones that are like two weeks old and they're just sort of going bloop, bloop. So the yeast is becoming dormant and it's falling to the bottom of a conical fermenter. Then we um, take, we are able Profit. to reuse the yeast about 20 times. Depends on yeah, how Yeah, it, it depends goes. on the strain, but uh, we definitely reuse it. We have a house strain, so they kind of curate our special yeah. house strain. Yeast is pretty cool. Yeast. Any scientists out there? <laughs> Uh, case for cans. This was a no-brainer for us. Yeah. Uh, when we started our business plan, we kind of said, do we want bottles, cans, what, what are we doing here? And everybody just cans right away. Um, no light penetrates a can. Uh, the aromas stay fresher in cans, uh, partially because uh, you don't get uh, leak, uh, se- uh, can't talk. Light. Uh, leak seal or seal for the bottle cap touches. The Losing top. my yeah tongue here, but um, <laughs> basically you don't have breakage. You can fit more on a truck. So again, it was a business decision. So we can fit more on a truck. We can save on fuel economy. We can save on shipping. We can save on pollution, if you will, <laughs> because we can fit thirty percent more per truck truckload into us not only from the empty cans coming to us, but also them leaving for mm-hmm. distribution. They're also easily and infinitely recyclable. Mm-hmm. So we love cans. I'm going to speed it along because we only have 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, we have f- four uh, major flagships. The Venture Pill is a nice light lager, a little bit dry hopped on the end, so it's more flavorful than a macro like Bud Miller or Clores. But it's along that line. It's really hard to do a craft pilsner. Um, they have a lot of clarity and all sorts of weird issues. So this is like kind of our brewer's beer. Uh, brewer friends that we know throughout the state love this beer of ours because it's a clean craft pilsner, which we just really dedicate to Lake Superior because it's amazing water for brewing a pilsner. Uh, the Bent Hop is our golden <laughs> IPA, by far our biggest seller, outsells everything else pretty much two to one. Um, hoppy but not over hopped and golden in color. So when you are drinking a beer or trying to uh, really use craft beer as in a connoisseur kind of way, you're looking at it, you're smelling it, just like wine, swirling it, all that stuff. So to have a golden in color IPA, they're usually red, uh, was it, that is so flavorful is a really big feat for like the 1% of people mm-hmm. that know it's supposed to be red. Uh, so <laughs> the girls are thrilled about it. Um, the ESD is my personal favorite. I think we're making them thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, the 14 degree ESD, which we heard is the angle of the bench shaft canoe paddle. Uh, we, it's the extra special amber ale, though. ESB technically is a British term for extra special bitter. 500 years ago when that came out in, in England, yeah, it was bitter. Now, compared to hoppy beers, not at all. Like, it's much more, we say ours is malt forward and amber and very balanced. Uh, it is also won an award at the Great American Beer Festival, which is the uh, largest, like, blind right. judging that happens um, in, in the U.S., U.S. And it won a bronze medal two years ago and the silver medal this year. So they don't know who it's, whose it is. It's pure taste testing by uh, trained judges. So it's a really big honor that that has won two years in a row. And then the black ale. We like to say it's in between a porter and a stout, and it has it's brewed with oats. We also have this guy over here, which is the actual black ale that has been additionally infused with cold-pressed coffee from locally made Duluth Coffee Company. So that's kind of the fifth flagship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then we have some seasonals. They're not all on here, but the Paddle Break Blonde comes out for spring-summer. Uh, we are going to do the Lollygagger again, which was a, a full charitable beer. So Lull Designs, which I think spoke at this before, Greg from Lull. Uh, we partnered together to donate 5% of proceeds from this beer, not just their sales, not sales. just proceeds, 5% to the Cox Trail system that they're building and raising money for. Uh, so that'll come out one more That's year cool. at least. We gave, uh, I think it was about $9,000 for them to help build uh, the Duluth Traverse. So does everybody know what the Duluth Traverse is? Huh? Bikers? <laughs> anyway, it's the longest single track 
trail in an urban environment in the entire country. It will be when it's And they're building it here in Duluth, so it's pretty cool. Uh, then we also have a roof rack. It's a Vienna-style lager in the fall. And currently we have the Harness uh, IPA, which is a very dense uh, I- IPA brewed with <coughs> We're cruising right along. Yeah. There we go. There they are. Shiny. Um, there's the award. We've canned over 3 million cans of Bent Paddle beer so far, gone through four major expansions. We obviously have to fix this. Uh, <laughs> went from a team of five to 32, right? 30. 30, uh, since opening in May of 2013. Uh, and that's the thing. When we started, it was the four of us. We did office things and all the things, and they did all the things. That the guys did all the things in the brewery, and we had a sales guy. If you are starting a business, you have nothing if you don't have sales from day one and a focus on sales from day one. So um, it was us and then our sales guy. And we started with 12 accounts in Duluth, and we really had to be like, we're a new brewery, what do you think, Pizza Luce? And they were like, we'll give it a whirl, and then we're by far we the have, biggest. Uh, we're coming up on just over 1,200 accounts now. We're all over the state. Uh, Superior, Wisconsin, we're just about to enter Fargo, and then moving into summer we'll be in, um, kind of, we call it the water region of Wisconsin, so um, North, Northwestern Wisconsin, Ashland, Bayfield, etc. This is my favorite. Increased our market share in our home market to 8% of all beers sold, including macro. Yes, really good. Okay. <laughs> They're excited. like, eh. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, this was, I think I gave these numbers earlier. Yeah. We're going to talk about facing challenges and especially how it relates to the ethics of this, too. So, yes, it sounds like sounds great, guys. You guys really like to talk about yourselves. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to say it's not without challenges. Uh, on a personal life, we have these young children. We are working all the time. Our spouses are working all the time. Work-life balance is better with the partnership, but it's still It's a balancing intense. Act. That is a good bullet point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, rapid growth is a good problem, but it's still a problem. Uh, we had to employ, like put all these thresholds in way faster. We always say we're like, you know, we're, our systems are still catching up to all of the hires that we've had. And we're like, I'm glad you're working. Just figure it out sometimes, <laughs> you know, like with new hires. And it's very crazy. So it's an awesome problem. But it still has to be managed well. And mm-hmm. we have to, you know, face challenges every day. I like to think at this point we have like one annual large challenge a year. I don't know if this is true. Uh, initially, we had a trademark dispute. So this is the original day pack, which eventually became the lollygagger. So this little teeny guy right here is a red hiker facing right. And there's a brewery in Vermont, um, a brewery that's slightly bigger than Summit, so a pretty large brewery, but one we had never heard of, um, that also has a red hiker facing right on their can, very different looking. It's um, also on the Boy Scout thing and every trailhead. And the California Quarter. We're not going to get into how... Montana State Park oh, sign. But we did get basically a letter being like, please stop using that. You know, we're defending our trademark. And we were like, whoa. Um, so we had many months of figuring that out uh, with their lawyers, our lawyers, me, ownership there, it, us. It was crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, in the end, we think it ended well. We had to, we can't use this logo anymore. And we have a threshold of design that Colin actually has taped up. It's of- called a trade dress. So they yep. basically said... You know, your trade dress, so the overall image of all the things on your can and on your website and as a company looks too similar to ours. So they, like she said, we can only use like one of three or if we use two of the things, one of the fonts has to change and it has to be significantly different from what their look looks like. And this is forever. So these are uh, designed constraints that we'll have forever. Mm-hmm. So we no money uh, changed hands. It wasn't like that. We think it ended very amicably, but we do have to work within these constraints. <laughs> but on the flip side, both companies, after this all came to be, both companies uh, wrote a dual press release. We wrote a press release together saying, we've come to consensus on this. Uh, happy to say it ended well. Breweries are about, uh, we call it uh, competition, Com- yeah. cooperative Competition. Cooperative competition. Uh, competition. And we, we each donated. We're going to trademark. <laughs> <laughs> best hurry. Um, we're going to, we donated $500 to the Green Mountain Trail System in Vermont, and they donated $500 to the Superior Hiking Trail here. And this all ended very well, we think. So it was a neat way. I think these annual challenges, we'll get into the next we two. We grow and learn. I mean, you know, we just a whole lot like every time. other business, it's new and we're learning. Um, that was a good 
That was a good one. And uh, in the interim <laughs> from that, I think if you take those sort of challenges as a business owner, we have this... We, in the middle of that, we were approached by law firms that specialize in trademarking, and we have vetted how much different ones were, and now we have every design vetted and a, at a reasonable price mm-hmm. um, to like prevent and add a layer of security to that um, mm-hmm. going forward. So we learned a lot about trademarking. You're mm-hmm. one in it. Mm-hmm. You're one. Um, other challenges, um, you know, again, circling back to kind of business ethics, we always said that uh, the quality of our beer could never, ever be compromised, and we weren't willing to do that to make money. Um, and that stands true for many things. Uh, one, we have a rule that our beer has to stay cold because it's unpasteurized. So we've actually turned down business from accounts that had no cooler space or were not willing to store our beer in coolers. Um, On a side note there... When you turn 21 and are looking for a craft beer, please email the brewery if you see beer out on the shelf or not in a cooler. It's very important to us, and we follow up on every one of those. So the more people at things like this that we tell about that, yeah. the better. So there's that. Um, also, we, you know, we distribution is, is a big thing. Like, we're not so... We, you know, it's not as important for us to have our beer everywhere because we have to be mindful about the quality and how does it get there and what is the transportation of getting it there and is it cold and will it stay, uh, you know, are they storing it in the way or transporting it in the way that we need to, up, you know, upkeep the, the quality. Also, we have had a couple batches of beer where... Something was off, and the flavor did not taste to the best quality. I think most people would have never noticed it, but we did, and so we dumped the beer. Um, a lot of money worth down the tube. I know it's terrible and sad, <laughs> and we all cried a little, but um, the integrity of our product is so important to us. And um, The biggest thing I think we're dealing with currently, it's a little bit back now, but um, have there, we joined a coalition called the Downstream Business Coalition, which basically had issues with some of the mining projects that are being uh, proposed in northern Minnesota. Uh, we're one of 64 members. We didn't form the coalition, but we definitely feel strongly about uh, our area in terms of how it's a, a place for outdoor recreation, but it's also a raw material to us and the other breweries that were on the list. Um, and we got a lot of flack for that. Um, it was, you know, there's a lot of people hurting for jobs on the Iron Range, and we feel for those people, and we feel for those accounts. Um, but as a business, it was always from the beginning, it's in the mission about sustainability for our, ourselves, the beer, employees, everyone. If the water here, the whole reason we started a brewery, if anything happens to that, we have no business. We have to tell all of our employees that we're shutting the doors, like all the things. So we're very proud in the end of, it's been very hard and we're learning how to work with it and try to explain like... Again, we're not anti-mining. We need mining. We have stainless steel. We have North American stainless steel in our brewery that we're really proud of. Um, it's specifically the open uh, open pit minings from the poly, proposed poly mit, um, Twin metals. Uh, it's a different minutes. type of mining. We have uh, Brian, uh, her husband is in his family. They're all professors of chemical engineering, all these things. So they know a lot about this. Brian felt really confident that if anything is to happen or just the amount of treatment needed, etc., we won't get into it too much. It's not good for water or our lifestyle here. And we came out publicly with that, and there's definitely been a lot of backlash. So we're maneuvering We that lost year. basically just, you know, again, back to ethics. We stood up for something we believed in, um, and we lost basically almost all of our accounts on the Iron Range. Um, while it doesn't make up a huge percentage of our overall sales, you know, it definitely, it was a hit. Yeah. So, But we were willing to, to do that because it was important to us. Um, on a flip side, back to the positive. <laughs> um... Community part, why is it working? Uh, again, just quality, quality, integrity. You can see it there, three times. Beer quality, beer quality, beer quality. Yeah. Uh, it's huge, huge importance. Community partnerships is a huge deal to us. Um, we, even at the cost of 
something more expensive, we choose local whenever we can. We also try to use uh, materials, processes, um, things that are environmentally friendly. Um, and as we continue to grow and have funding, we'd even like to do more like solar or um, wind power. Again, with the lull thing, these, uh, these are our tap handles. Um, they are made from lull materials, which are 100% recycled milk jugs. Uh, and the front part is also made in uh, near the city, so it's a 100% Minnesota-made tap handle. Most of them are made overseas and shipped here and all the things. Um, many examples of that. We have the Duluth Coffee, as I mentioned. Uh, also, We have yoga at the brewery. This, this is crazy how much that's this, grown. That was we obviously need to update our flower <laughs> plant. Another thing we have to do. <laughs> um, so that is the community partnerships in addition to the charitable piece. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, it. that's it. So we have about, I don't know, five, ten minutes. If, does anyone have questions? Or did we? Yeah. 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 Um, oh, yeah. Um, We asked a few. I mean, yes, they weren't very interested. Yeah. Now I think they are. It was actually not <laughs> enough risk, we learned. Like, people that are used to funding huge, mega, uh, they were kind of like, eh. Yeah. It was so. more of a passion project, like I said, for the two out of three. I wonder, yeah. Another question. Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, you were talking about the build out and how it's like we are going to do this and then we grow and we take another step. Thresholds, yeah. It, a game. Yeah, a build out. Um, game? <laughs> what, what's it called? Cake Mania. No. It's a game basically you bake cakes and uh, you sell them and then you can go and buy. Um, Is it an app kind of game like on yeah, your phone? Yeah. Oh, that'd be funny. Oh, the brewery Build did brewery. this much. Like, yeah, that's. Yeah. I don't have time. On a rainy yeah, day. Yeah. On a rainy day. <laughs> Do you want to develop? You? Yeah, Are you a, an app developer? <laughs> Does anyone need a job? Internship? It's a really neat idea. I like uh, it. <laughs> other questions? Um, so my little brother is really into like, the home brew stuff. Do you have any recommendations for people who are looking to get into that kind of thing? To get into it professionally? I School. Do. School. Interning, working for a brewery, even if it's just in the tap room at first, and sticking with it as mm -hmm. much as possible. There are, there's a huge brewery bubble happening in Minnesota, um, mostly because of the tap room law of 2011, which Surly basically single-handedly passed. We mm -hmm. didn't have a um, tap room in our original discussions because it wasn't legal yet, so we built a tap room on after the fact to our business plan. But because of the tap room law. And I also think the economic downturn, a lot of people were out of work or whatever, they liked brewing, all the things came together to create this brewery bubble. And we're going to start to see some repercussions of that in the next few years. So anything that your brother, brother could do to differentiate himself and make it more professional will lead really, really far. There's also a huge conversation in Minnesota and across the nation about quality control. Mm -hmm. uh, the craft brew uh, public is also kind of new, so they're not, they're like, this local craft beer, I've never had a different one. This one tastes great, I think. I've never had craft beer before. <laughs> and it's maybe not good. It maybe has an infection, or it's just not good. Um, and the craft beer drinking public is becoming more educated. So as soon as that happens, all the breweries have to step up with that, too. So, But yes, education, education and just willing work to and work from the bottom up. right away. Just, yeah. Anyone else? No? Don't be shy. <laughs> right. Do you have anything you wanted us to touch on that maybe we didn't? What it's like to run a business. You've given us, you know. <laughs> it's, it's, we have a lot of pride. Um, I personally, again, worked for this large corporation for 15 years. So as much work as it is, it's for us. So it's different. Um, and I, can, you know, I can sleep in till eight and roll into work and not punch a time clock, but I'm also working then till eight o'clock at night. So, and also since this is an ethics class, like I believe the brewery is a neat extension of our beliefs right. and I see that happening more and more. People are pretty sick of the consumerism all around and they want to see local businesses. They're engaging more with local and, you know, this has been going on a while, but I see it on a larger scale. And to mean something as a brewery, like, 
and people might know that and align well um, or just see them as good community partners, any type of business locally, makes you want to maybe spend a little bit more on that product because you know it was made ethically and it's employing people that you know you know, around town. It's, it's helping your community. So I really see that as a trend in all types of business, I hope. That I hope stays. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, oh, one one. please. Yeah. That's why we're here. <laughs> Tech ethics. So dealing a lot with computers and stuff. Yeah. Um, have you guys dealt much with? I know that sometimes uh, smaller businesses can kind of be tech, like away from technology. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, have you guys dealt much with any ethical decisions? We're lucky. Ethical decisions? Well, I don't know about you know. <laughs> ethically, I think with technology, the only. You know, arena. We're not shy at all. Uh, we have, we have Colin on board who does all of our tech. He wrote our website from code. Um, the thing that I think comes up with ethical choices is social media. Um, I handle all of our social media with a little bit of help from the team. You know, just because it's pretty constant. And it's just about like whether you engage certain comments or threads or you know specifically the you know the water issue has has kind of taken a toll a little bit or when to leave things up and let them just <coughs> sort of dissolve into cyberspace or to remove them like are they vulgar are they hateful are they uh, that would be probably just the only technology ethical stuff that comes up. And we tend to ask, so we did some strategic planning recently, and was it Meg that told us to get a um, tech, uh, like a, basically like on your website you list out what you will and will not tolerate, like right. a, te a tech a policy. policy. Like if, um, it's, if you're swearing and it's hateful, we're going to remove it. Yeah, and it's not just willy-nilly, we don't like your bad review. It's yeah. never that. It's like we want it to be a threshold that they could read online. So that's an ethics piece, I think, mm -hmm. of like yeah, here's the threshold. It's been pre-stated. If you mess with it, of course we're going to take it down, but it has nothing to do with we just don't like what you said about us. Right. Like we'll leave yeah. bad reviews yeah. up because not everybody's going to love, you know, Ben <laughs> Paddle Beer or right. whatever. So that's a good question. Is Social good question. media is a big thing that – had you asked me four years ago, I was like, oh, Facebook's fun, but it, it really is a driving tool yes. for marketing, and it's just different now. So, anything else? Come to Ben Paddle when if you're 21. 21. And enjoy it responsibly and drink it like wine, like a connoisseur. Quality, not quantity. <laughs> right. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.